Now, it doesn't matter if woodworking is just a hobby or if you're trying to build a professional business. There are certain things that we all have to learn very early on. And most of the time we learn these things the hard way through a bit of trial and error and a lot of mistakes. So here's a few things that I've learned along the way that I think every woodworker needs to know. All right, and to start things off, we need to talk about the most important thing in our wood shop. And hey, no, where are you going? Hey, eyes up here. No, no, not the table saw, it's the wood. I mean, after all, we can't build anything without good materials. So that's where we're gonna start. When you get ready to start working with some hardwoods instead of construction lumber, there's a few things that you need to know before you go step foot into a hardwood dealer or lumber yard. Believe me, you don't wanna be like me and just show up without a clue on how any of this works or any of the lingo and you look like a complete idiot. I certainly did. So the first thing that you need to know is the thickness of the board is always gonna be referenced in quarters of an inch. So a one inch thick board will be listed as four quarters. Something that is one and a half inches will be six quarters. And a two inch thick board will be listed as eight quarters. That's just the way they refer to things. That makes their math a bit easier and it's been done that way for generations. So. Just accept it, you're not gonna change it. And the other thing to know about buying hardwood lumber is it's not sold based on just the length, but by the total volume of the piece of wood. Hey, can I get a cup of walnut? But instead of cups or gallons, the unit of measure is called a board foot. To determine how many board feet are in a piece of lumber, it's really easy. You just take the length in inches times the width times the thickness, and divide that by 144. And that's gonna give you a, how many board feet are in that piece of wood. So if we take this piece of cherry, this is 25 inches long by six inches wide and two inches thick. Multiply that together, divide by 144, and this is two board feet. Now this piece of maple, this is 40 inches long, seven and a quarter inches wide and one inch thick. Multiply that together, divide by 144, and this is also two board feet. So as far as the lumber yard is concerned, these are the exact same volume. You just multiply that volume times the board foot price to get the price for these two boards. Now, regardless of what material you're using, there's some important things to know when you're in the shop. First off, don't forget to account for the blade curve whenever you're making your cut. If you try to put your blade right on the line, your part's gonna be a little bit shorter due to the amount of material that the blade is gonna remove. I always mark one side of my boards as the scrap piece so I know that I can run my blade through that without ruining the part. Now we've all heard the saying, measure twice, cut once. However, if I need to make a really precise cut, I'm not gonna try and nail that in just one go. Instead, I will cut it deliberately a little bit too big and then slowly sneak up on it until I get the perfect size that I need. Now the easiest way to take little tiny slivers off of your board is to actually push the board into the blade just slightly and then make your cut. This is gonna deflect the blade just a little bit and you'll get a very, very slim cut. Now, if you need to make multiple pieces that are all the same size, make sure you're using a stop block so that you get precise, repeatable cuts. It's gonna be a lot faster and a lot easier than trying to take measurements every time and cut to the same spot. Now, there's a lot of options out there for buying premium stop blocks that will fit on your tools and equipment. However, you can always use a clamp on a block of wood to make a quick and simple stop block that is gonna work just fine. All right, this next one is very important. Anytime you're cross-cutting material, the long drain is running towards the fence. Whether you're using a miter gauge or even a sled, you should never have your material riding against the fence when you're going through the blade. It's a very good chance that this cutoff is gonna get wedged in between the blade and the fence, and when it does, it's gonna kick back at you at about Mach 3 and take you out before you even know what happened. So if you're gonna be making cross cuts, make sure the fence is out of the way so this piece has plenty of room to sit out here without getting wedged and kicked back towards you. Now, if you do wanna use the fence so that you can have repeatable cuts when you're doing your cross cut, get yourself a clamp and a block of wood and put it on the back of the fence here. Make sure it's far enough back so that when you clear that block, there's nothing in between your off cut and the fence so you don't have the kickback. When you drill a hole through a board, there's a pretty good chance that you're gonna get a really nasty blowout on the backside and no one wants a nasty blowout on their backside. To prevent this, make sure you use a scrap piece of wood as a backer board. That's gonna support the wood fibers so that you don't get that nasty blowout and you get a nice clean cut instead. When you're using screws, always make sure you pre-drill and countersink the hole before you drive the screw. Otherwise, you're very likely to split the wood. 
Instead of guessing at what drill bit size you need, I recommend picking up some of these tapered countersink bits. These are specially made for drilling the pilot hole and doing the countersink all in one go. And they're already the exact size you need for the screws that you're using. Now, if you don't mind spending a little bit extra money, I highly recommend this Amana bit. This has a non-marring depth stop on it so that you get the exact same depth in your countersink every time for repeatable results. When you're building your projects, you wanna start using relative dimensioning as soon as possible. Now, don't worry, this isn't anything as complex as Einstein's theory of relativity. This simply means you use your project to determine the size of your parts instead of relying on the numbers in your plans or taking actual measurements. In this case, I need a board to span this distance, but I don't know this exact measurement and it doesn't matter. All I have to do is put my board in place where I want it and mark it directly from the workpiece. I still don't know what this measurement is and I don't care because the board fits exactly because I used relative dimensioning. Now, when it comes to finishing your project, it doesn't matter which finish you use. If you want a flawless finish, you have to start with proper sanding. First off, I always make sure I have on hand all the sanding grits from 100, 120, 150, 180, and 220. Now, you shouldn't need all of these for every project, but let me show you the thought process I go through when it comes to choosing a grit. All right, let's take, for example, this piece of oak. If my project looked like this side of the oak, it's very rough, has a lot of scratches and deep marks in it that I need to remove. So that's a lot of material I need to take off of this piece. If my project looked like this, I'm gonna start with 100 grit. Now, if I turn this around, I have another side here. I have some glue marks. I have some marks from the machinery. So, but this is a lot smoother than the first side. So I have less material that needs to be removed. I do have a few defects that I wanna get out. In this case, I would start with 120. And finally, on this side of the yoke, this is very, very smooth. There's almost no defects, no deep scratches. This is a pretty flat piece of the board. So in this case, since I have very little material to remove, I would start with 150. Now that you know what grit to start with, how high up do you need to sand? Well, I typically only sand either 180 or 220, depending on the finish that I'm using. If I'm gonna be using a film building finish, like paint, polyurethane, lacquer, anything like that, I'm gonna sand up to 180. There's just no reason to go any higher. Now, if I'm gonna be using an oil finish, like a teak oil, Danish oil, even some of the hard wax oils, I will take that up to 220 so that the wood has a smoother feel since it's not gonna have a film over the top of it. Now you know what grit to start sanding with and what grit to finish sanding with, but what do you do in between? Well, there's a really simple rule of thumb, and that is don't skip more than one grit in the progression. All right, so let's say with your project, you wanna start with 120 and you wanna sand up to 180. You would go 120 and you can skip 150 and then sand with 180 grit, and then you can start your finishing process. Now let's say on another project, you're gonna start at 100 and you wanna go up to 220. You go 100, 150, and then 220. But if you wanted to go from 100 to 180, you start with 100, you can skip 120, but then you have to do 150, and then you can do 180 because we can't skip more than one grit. Now, if you only learn one thing from me today, let it be this right here. This is the most important thing that I have to share with you. What do all of these products have in common? All of these products contain oils or chemicals that when they start to cure will generate heat and can spontaneously combust. This means if you finish with some of these and you wad them up and throw them in the trash, you can very easily start a fire in your house. I'm not saying that to scare you away from using any of these. I use all of these products. I like every single one of them. I, you just need to recognize the risk and make sure that you properly dispose of your rags after you're done. The safest way to handle the rags whenever you're done is to lay them out flat on some concrete and let them dry overnight. Once they've dried, they're completely safe. You can then wad them up and throw them in the trash. Now, anytime you're trying out a new finish or a new stain, test the material out on some off cuts from your project before putting it on the project yourself. That way, if you don't like the results, you haven't ruined your project and you can go back with something else. So those are a few of the essentials that I think every woodworker needs to know. And if you thought this was helpful, please let me know and I'll make a part two with some more essentials. Make sure and go check out some of my other videos for more great tips and woodworking projects. I'll see you in the next one.